Hello, and welcome to the Nintendo Power Retrospectives. I'm Count Zero. 2013 has come and gone, and with the conclusion of that year, it's time to put an end to Nintendo Power's second year as well, which also means it's time for the best of the rest of the years um, 1989 through 1990. Well, the chunks of those years that were covered by Nintendo Power. Magazines are weird with numbering, anyway. Though, all that said, this time the term best could be used a little more loosely, as there are some real stink burgers on this list, which somehow managed to slip through into the top 30. As my Nintendo Power database bit the dust since the last time I did one of these, I'll be doing the games in alphabetical order instead of how they score, and I won't be doing total scores or anything like that. Um, but hey, I'll be highlighting the box art instead, so that's kind of cool. So, let's get started. The Adventures of Lolo the Adventures of Lolo is a port of a puzzle game for the Famicom Disk System that plays like a Sokoban game with enemies. The game puts the player in control of Lolo, who must navigate a series of puzzle rooms, evading dangerous enemies and pushing others out of the way, and moving boxes and so forth, and destroying blocks and all that, all that kind of puzzle gamey stuff, in order to be reunited with his kidnapped one true love, Lala. The game starts simple, but as with most puzzle games, gets more and more com- progressed. Um, complex as the player progresses, as players must get to with enemies who have specific movement patterns or are limited to certain areas that they have to go through, or who have deadly shots which are fired when the pl- player is at eye level with an enemy, or enemies which don't kill instantly, but who will, if the player is wi- wise and wary, um, will block the player in an area where they can't escape from. All that sort of thing. This game is definitely a lot of fun, and... It's also a game that players could probably spend a lot of game learning, a lot of time learning the ropes of. This is definitely a contender for my pick of the show, and would also go on my list of games that I kind of wish Arena would play on Game Center CX, as it feels like something that is right up his alley. Baseball Stars. Baseball Stars is a game that runs a lot of the technical limitations that other NES baseball games face, which unfortunately make the game, in my eyes, not fun to play. In particular, the batting controls are solid and the pitching controls are decent, but everything completely falls apart when it comes to fielding. The game has all of the problems that other NES baseball games have when it comes to fielding. You cannot move your fielders underneath pop flies with the same degree of skill that fielders can in other console baseball games from later generations. The camera is locked on the ball, that means which means it goes up. Your outfielders are off-screen, and instead you're controlling your infielders. Now, this is a pop fly to the infield. This isn't a problem. Um, but when he goes to the outfield, particularly if he goes to, like, in between um, two fielder positions, you just can't get your guys in position in time to catch it. This is particularly a problem because the AI is pretty good at moving players under fly balls in the outfield. Thus the computer will always be more effective at fielding pop flies to the outfield than really you can ever hope to be. Indeed, the best option for the player is to hit ground, fast grounders to the outfield, because in which situation the, there's no way for opposing players to get in position in time, but on the other hand, low grounders, low fast grounders to the outfield don't go over the wall and get you a home run, which is a note the only other real way to get ahead of the AI. So, that said, Baseball Stars is a game that's ahead of its time in several respects. The game doesn't use a password mode for continuing your season, it instead lets you save your game through battery backup on the cartridge. Additionally, you pick which teams are in your season, and you determine the length of the season, the number of teams, and the number of games that you're playing in each series. Further, you can create new teams and edit teams. So, if you want to, in your copy of Baseball Stars, set it up so it's got basically like modern baseball teams, you want to add the Seattle Mariners or the Baltimore Orioles or any other baseball team, really, you can do that. And kind of the players have stats somewhat similar to how you think those players' stats are. This game really has serious potential that is honestly 
undermined by the fielding problems. And I really think that if this game gets an SNES, got an SNES release or re-release later on, that hopefully through the use of the Mode 7 technology, the game would be able to overcome the limitations that hurt and hamper this game and really let it shine. So, I guess I'd call it somewhat recommended, but honestly, if there's a remake that we come across later, I'll recommend that one a lot more than I'll recommend this one. Battle of Olympus Battle of Olympus is something of a Faxanadu clone with problems with enemies moving under your weapon swing, a character with a purely cosmetic shield on his character design as opposed to the shield from Legend of Zelda and Zelda 2, which actually does something. And real and well, after playing this for about an hour, I couldn't find any signs of shops or inns to upgrade my weapon. Um, enemies will drop health and slain, health when slain, but it's not always consistent. And I'm really not sure what in this game is supposed to be money to be used to be spent on weapon upgrades and armor upgrades and buying new spells and that sort of thing. Um, to be used at the weapon and item upgrade shops, which should be there, which fact Xanadu had, and which Legend of Zelda, both Zelda and Zelda 2 had, but which appear to be completely absent here. I'm kind of flabbergasted by this game. It's a game which I was kind of actually looking forward to trying out for a while. Um, just because I remember seeing articles about it. But finding really disappointing. Um, I kind of recommend skipping this game, or at the very least, if you're going to play this, go ahead and get your real Game Genie Pro Action Replay on here. Because it's... It's not... It's, it controls okay. It has some problems with the jumping, also. Um, it's kind of weirdly floaty when it's... N when, except when it's not. And the except when it's not part is kind of sporadic. It's not really fun. It's not what I was looking for in a, in a side-scrolling action RPG kind of game. Give it a pass. Back to the Future. Oh, Boy, Back to the Future. What to say about this game that hasn't been said by the angry video game nerd. By the way, this is the first of two games we're covering this episode that has been previously reviewed by one AVGN, one James Rolfe. Honestly, I can't think of anything to say about this game that he really didn't say in his review. Um including trying to come up with new swear words, because really, the top-down stages of this game aren't great, but they're not really terrible either. Now, I'll admit, because gameplay capture and all this is being done through emulation, I am playing this on a controller that has eight an 8-direction D-pad. Now, some of these were also made for the NES, like the NES Advantage controller and its arcade stick, and the NES Max, but when all said and done, this game... It's not really fun. Um, top-down stages with an 8-direction controller, and they exist for the NES, aren't terrible. I was able to beat them without much hassle, um, even with dying several times. But the set-piece stages, like, for example, Marty fending off some of Biff's goons at the soda fountain, are pretty terrible and pretty unforgiving. Um, and it's the kind of thing where it's a pain in the you pain in the butt with a normal controller, but if it lets you cheese it with a controller that has turbo fire, that wouldn't that'd be fine. But the rate of fire of the um well, I suppose the root beer floats that you're throwing, um isn't it's just too s slow to really be effective. Um I will say that maybe if there was like a Freaking, I don't know, a Game Genie code that sped up your rate of fire, or some secret menu that lets you throw the um, shakes more rapidly, that might be better, for certain values of better, but honestly this game is just not worth your time. Um, if you really want to try, like, try out some of the 
more dire examples of LJN's licensed games, I guess you might want to check this out, but otherwise, give it a miss. Ghostbusters. Now, this is a port of a licensed game for the Commodore 64 and other home PCs based on the movie. And this game is a obtuse grind. I will say right now, if for some reason you do decide to pick up this game, in spite of my recommendation that you not pick up this game, for God's sake, get the manual. Whether buy an actual print copy or hunt down a scan online and print that off, but have the manual with you. This game has three different modes, which each control differently. And so the, the controls are different things. You have your top-down driving sequences, where you're driving the Ecto-1 around. And you steer with the D-pad, and then you have, um, you, you have, you get a ghost vacuum, which you activate with B button, I believe, in the controller. A few other things. You have the actual ghost busting segments, where you're in charge of controlling two ghost busters and trying to capture as many ghosts as possible. And buttons do different things, it's different points in the sequence. And if you cross the streams at any point in this, it kicks you out of the ghost busting scene. Like they said in the movie, don't cross the streams. Then there is the sequence at the end of the game where you climb up the uh, hotel and then eventually fight Zool. All of these play can control differently. All of these things have different... The buttons do different things based on what mode you're in. So having the manual is essential so you know what buttons you need to be pushing when. So, and the cycle of this game is you start off, you buy your starting Ghostbusters gear. You then... Ghostbusting gear. You then go around... New York, busting ghosts for money to get gear upgrades, which eventually will give you enough basically higher quality gear to take on Zool and ultimately win the game. And in the course of the and in the course of this you have to contend with the cost of gas as you drive around New York, and eventually you will run out of gas and have to push your car to the gas station, or you'll have to preemptively drive to the gas station to fill up the tank before going to the next building to bust ghosts. The problem is, well, this game is a tedious, tedious grind. The game is all about the money management. You have to have money to pay for gas for Ecto-1. You need to upgrade your gear to, cast, to let you catch more ghosts at one whack, because the least expensive trap only lets you catch one ghost, and you have to drive back to your headquarters to empty it out before going back out again. And that costs gas, so you also have to manage your gas that you have in Ecto-1. And you also have to manage um, the sort of PK level of New York. If it gets too high, Gozer the Gozerian comes out, and that leads to bad things happening. So you have to upgrade your Ghostbusting gear so you can more effectively cast Ghosts, so you have the money to afford the ultimate final upgrades of ghost protect of body armor that you protect against ghosts and ghost bait to let you get past the ghosts in the game's last stage, which is climbing up the stairs of the building, those long, tread, um, uh, tedious flights of stairs from the movie before finally fighting Gozer. Now, to be clear, I'm okay with grinding. I beat the original Dragon Warrior. Which I mentioned, in my, and I, which, as I mentioned in my review of that game, is all about grinding. But the difference is, what makes grinding work and makes it fun is giving you a sense of progression in some fashion or another on multiple aspects. And you need the feeling that you've, you're always progressing in some form or another. You are, even if you're not getting enough money to get your next gear upgrade, you're getting experience points to level up, and this can make your character stronger or giving them new spells, or that sort of thing. So, even if you have a long ways to go to the next more awesome sword, you, in the process, you'll also gain more hit points and more magic points and possibly learn new spells, in addition to everything else you've been doing while clear making your way through the game. Um, or in a game like Etrian Odyssey, they also add on top of this with your um, sword, with, with your money advancement, and your uh, XP advancement, they also have exploring the dungeon. And so there's an additional bit there. You're exploring more of the dungeon, and if you're not exploring more of the dungeon, you're collecting um, resources that you can sell to the to the shop, item shop, which will make new 
um, weapons and armor and other items available to let you get further in the dungeon. Th this means that always, no matter what you do, you're doing something that really makes your character better. At no point are you doing something that feels just tedious, busy work, or doesn't really help you advance. With Ghostbusters, the only real vector of advancement is money. And the problem is that some of the things that you have to do in order to advance in money is not, doesn't feel like it's, in, it's actually helping you advance. In particular, if you're driving around, you end up gas up, you push at the gas station, that derails you from the thing of getting more money. If you have to take a detour to the gas station because your Ecto-1 is low, you feel like you're not, that you're doing something that isn't advancing your money. There are things which can happen which make this slightly better. If you, once you get the ghost vacuum for Ecto-1, you can actually cast ghosts while you're driving around, which gets you money. So even if you go in the gas station, it's distinctly possible that, that by the time you get there, you have already earned enough money to pay for however much gas you used, plus some left over. But still, this doesn't help by the fact that the number of upgrades are very limited, the amount of upgrade space you have is limited. Ecto-1 can only carry four items, it only has four item slots. One of those is probably going to be taken up early on by your, uh, by the vacuum, plus you also have to carry whatever type of proton pack you're using to let you catch ghosts, and a trap to hold them. So, this leads to problems where, I mean, honestly, there's no way to upgrade Ecto-1 so it can hold more items. There's no way to upgrade Ecto-1 so it can carry more gas. You can't put an expanded fuel tank in there. Um, you can't, I don't know, adjust the engine or upgrade the engine so it uses less gas. You can't install, like, the fuel efficiency pack or whatever in Ecto-1. So, there's those problems. You can't add things up so, like, another example. The body armor and the ghost bait that you use for the final level of the game takes up slots on there. So, once you've got enough money for those, you may end up having to drop some items that you would otherwise be using um, to get like, additional money. And just to be clear, if you don't get Gozer, um, and you don't get all that bit, ah, short version, if you fail at the boss fight, it's not game over if there's enough if you haven't hit the um, PK meter cap yet. But you do get docked a bunch of money, which means you then have to go and earn back a bunch of cash and stuff to um, possibly rebuy your gear or whatever. Um, drive around for a bit. And I don't know if this if you also lose your body armor. Um, so you need to be at a certain money cap before you actually take on Gozer. And if you're not there when you go there the first time, by the time you bought the body armor you might not have enough money to... Yeah, long story short, and I'm kind of rambling, this game is just too much of a slog and feels too much like work to be actually a fun game. Um, now, there are other Ghostbusters games in the similar, in a different vein that are made um, for 16-bit systems. Now, there's Genesis version, there might be a Super Nintendo version. I have not played those yet. This could be distinct, and so this could be a distinct situation where the limitation that this game has, and why it's not so good, is connected to the, har the hardware limitations of the NES. That basically, the reason you can't upgrade the storage space in Ecto-1 is because with what they're dealing with for coding for the NES, they couldn't have you upgrade Ecto-1 for more s equipment slots or for um, reduced fuel consumption, or all this sort of thing. And that with a system with more memory on the cartridge and more processing capability, they'd be able to handle that information. I don't know. Um, if we get a Super Nintendo Ghostbusters game, I'll check it out, and I'll find out then. In the meantime, though, I can't really recommend this game. Even if you like Ghostbusters, don't play this game. Really, the more, the more recent Ghostbusters shooter is actually a better Ghostbusters game than this one. Goal. Goal is a soccer game from Jalico. As with baseball stars, I feel like I'm, well, running into technical difficulties and hardware limitations as I'm playing this. I can't do targeted passes to other players on my team. 
which ultimately discourages passing. Um, while you can do tackles in the game, I never was qu really quite able to pull off the actual act of tackling and consistently, like, probably like, actually, like, hit the button inputs to have the tackle happen. And when I did do a tackle, it wasn't always effective. Um, not that I'm saying tackling should be a certain sure kill, but I, like, in short, I wasn't quite sure if I was actually, like, you know, making anywhere near the target, so I wasn't really thus clear whether tackling was actually effective for me. Um, and supposedly, if you do them properly, you can trigger a foul and a penalty kick. I never saw that happen in the course of a game. So, tackling is a crapshoot. Passing is a crapshoot. That leaves shooting, and shooting at least has an interesting mechanic to make things entertaining there. Uh, you can put a little English on, this, on the ball spin by once you shoot, at any point during its path, you can hold down B and press a direction to make it go further by holding up, go slower by going down, or put English on it and make it spin to the left or right by using left or right controls. And that can allow you to do the kind of shots to put the ball in the upper corner of the net, or all the other sort of sorts of stuff that makes for, well, the kind of goals that you see in in football slash soccer, depending on where in the world you are. Um, so we have some nice ideas here, and I like them, and I like the implementation of the little English, putting the English on the uh, shot. But it really doesn't hold up well in competition with any later soccer games, uh, particularly modern soccer games. So, again, those are the cases where, with sports games, the more recent stuff is almost always better, just in terms of playability. So, give this game a miss. Nobunaga's Ambition Nobunaga's Ambition is a game that I played the hell out of as a kid. I love strategy games of all stripes, from um, Stratego and Risk to Chess to war games like Cry Havoc. So when I learned about this game as a kid, I had to have a copy. And once I got it, I enjoyed it immensely, and I played that game for years. No exaggeration. That game like had a permanent place in my NES for quite some time. That said, nostalgia has not clouded my perception of this game. Nobunaga's Ambition has not aged well, even within its own series. The NES isn't really able to handle a kind of, the kind of presentation that this game needs to look good and give the player the information they need to make some educated decisions on how they're going to use their resources. Um, so, for example, names of province, uh, provinces are instead given as numbers. Um, full names aren't given for generals. Um, all sorts of other stuff. Later games had a more elegant presentation. They gave more room to maneuver on maps for more advanced strategies. Um, and honestly, I mean, even games like on the PC, like Shogun Total War and its sequel, Shogun 2, have taken the game one better by putting battles in a real-time perspective and giving more depth to the strategic action aspects of the game, in addition to having a AI which makes alliances meaningful by having the the AI able to remember those alliances and have them last longer in game than alliances do in Nobunaga's ambition on the NES. So I feel nostalgia for this game. I enjoyed it when I played it. I may certainly pop it in every once in a while and play it some more. But I can't really recommend this title over later games in the series, particularly to people who are new to the franchise. And I certainly can't recommend it over the Shogun Total War games, which you can get from Steam. I recommend picking those up instead. Jordan vs. Bird My feelings on console basketball games are clear. I don't like them. Making a one-on-one -on -one console basketball game doesn't make it better. In fact, it actually makes it worse. What, console basketball games have enough difficulty managing things like passing and shooting you know, the basic fundamentals of basketball, that when you take out the strategic elements of passing to get around defense and all this other sorts of stuff, that it ultimately becomes just a straight test of player versus AI. And the problem is, 
the AI is always a cheating bastard, particularly when it comes to shooting, and generally it will always win. In fact, when I played this, um, played the game for review and valuation, I got a shutout game where I missed a shot, the player got, the opposing player got control of the ball and kept it for the rest of the game. Now, there, you can do things to adjust this. You can make it so, um, that the, that whoever makes the shot uh, has to hand off and hand over the ball to the person who, who failed to make a shot, who failed to defend after each time. And it goes to disable penalties, which, by the way, there are penalties and fouls in a one-on-one -on -one basketball game, particularly for stuff like guarding and, def and blocking, which is absurd when it's a situation where there's only one player on both sides Blocking shouldn't be a factor. That's just something that happens. It's going to happen. You can't do that sort of thing with... It It just kind of breaks my mind a bit with my understanding of basketball combined with the really dumb penalties that they choose to implement in this game. It's one thing if, if they're going to have fouls and penalties and make it so you can't push and shove. That's acceptable. That is in accordance with the rules of basketball, both street ball and and NBA ball, and it works. Bl banning blocking just makes it so that the attacking player can run right over you over and over again. So, it's just, this game is just a, a whole bunch of really bizarre questions about the developer's understanding of basketball, of the uh, of, of the decisions made in the design process in terms of what implementing all this sorts of stuff. It's kind of like, it makes it actually kind of makes the game a fascinating curiosity in terms of how a development team can totally misunderstand basketball in these fashions and make such a horribly broken basketball game. This is not to recommend picking up this game for your own entertainment or pleasure unless you're a masochist. If you're interested in making a retro clone style basketball game, go for it. You can actually probably learn some interesting things about what not to do from this game. But don't but if you don't pick this up if you're in a used game store or whatever and you see this game on the shelf, just walk away, go somewhere else in the store, maybe look to see if there's a good game around it but probably not. It's probably any bin that would have this game in it is a bin for games that are terrible. Just avoid. Wheel of Fortune. Game show video games, particularly when they're licensed from a real-world show, like Wheel of Fortune is, don't really work as well as video games, at least not single-player ones, um, when they're played against the AI. The AI is always kind of broken, as the designers can't really write around the fact that the computer just knows the answer to the puzzle. Games which, when you're playing single player, you're just playing solo and not competing against an AI score, like, for example, the You Don't Know Jack series of games, tend to work better in this regard. Unfortunately, games like You Don't Know Jack would not get past Nintendo's censorship policy if they existed at this time, because all of the off-color and risque humor would probably make the Nintendo sensors' heads explode, a la if you tried to make a Animaniacs game with all of the getting the crap past the radar humor that that show had on the NES, they'd probably try to find ways to, I don't know, slip religious symbology or that sort of thing in the background just to mess with the Nintendo sensors' heads. Thus, while it didn't particularly like playing Wheel of Fortune single player, which is normally how I play games for this. It's certainly a game that I can recommend multiplayer, particularly for um, parties or that sort of thing. In fact, actually, I do kind of miss or regret the fact that this episode is coming out on New Year's as opposed to before New Year's, so I can recommend people pick up this game before New Year's Day to have at your New Year's party. But in any case... It's a good game to have in the new, to have like, if you're gonna put an old retro video game in a console, in your NES or your NES retro clone and have that at your party, this is actually a pretty good game to go with. It, whether you're playing really game show games in general, whether you're doing like several players each controlling their own 
buzzer or whatever, like with Jeopardy, or hot, handing off the controller from player to player, as would probably be done with Wheel of Fortune, game show games just work really well in this sort of environment. They, they are a game, type of game, that generally work best in multiplayer. And thus, Wheel of Fortune is my multiplayer pick of the episode. On the single player side, I'm going with Adventures of Lobo. Puzzle game fans will find a lot to like here, and as I mentioned earlier, this is the kind of game which actually I'd really like to see on something like Game Center CX, um, because Arenos has self-admitted strong point in video games, the puzzle-style games, and he'd probably be very likely to beat this, and also have some fun with it while beating it. Next time, we start up year 3 with issue 14 for Nintendo Power for July of 1990. If you enjoyed this episode, please give the show a thumbs up or like on your on the video platform it's going out on, and subscribe to, ch subscribe to the channel to be notified when the next episode comes out. I'll see you next time.